You're watching City Channel 4, your window to our community. Today's presentation is uh, Organizing, Managing, and Protecting Your Financial Records. Uh, it's brought to you by uh, Iowa City Hospice, uh, today represented by uh, Maggie Elliott, Executive Director, and Sarah Krieger, who works on a program called Honoring Your Wishes. And the other sponsor is Elder Services. Uh, Susan Ware is the Executive Director. And uh, thank you for letting us use the facilities and providing the lunch. So uh, I'm going to probably uh, divert just a little bit from the, t from the title of today's presentation, and you'll, you'll, see, uh, you'll see why a little bit later. But first, let me introduce myself. I'm Stan Miller. I'm a retired CPA. Uh, three years ago, I retired from McGladry after 36 years. And uh, besides my audit practice of nonprofit organizations and uh, uh, financial institutions, uh, I also had an individual tax practice uh, with individual tax returns and personal financial planning. Um, so um, today is I, I, the, uh, the the purpose I think is to try to prepare you if you're interested in having a conversation about um, your financial and personal records, so that when the time comes, you can be thinking about transitions. Because uh, someday someone is likely to manage your finances uh, besides yourself. So, so the purpose is to kind of think about what's the background and preparation you might need to do uh, to get ready for that day. But first I'm going to uh, give you a couple of facts here and then make a prediction or two and you see whether you agree with this thing. But uh, everybody has got some kind of personal and financial records. And that not only is your bank accounts and retirement accounts and Social Security and <coughs> Medicare, uh, health care records, maybe personal financial documents, could be family history, it could be photographs, it could be your music, all kinds of things that we maintain in some fashion or another that we sort of care about and want to, uh, to uh, protect and manage and organize and someday transition to somebody else. So everybody has those things. and. A lot of these things involve a high degree of sensitivity, and uh, particularly for people in the generation of the folks I'm seeing here, these things were a lot of these things were considered private, and uh, so for one reason or another, we were all pretty sensitive about these things. Uh, another fact is this isn't a prediction; this is a fact. Our affairs have gotten a lot more complex in the last, uh, let's say, 15 to 20 years. Uh, we have more accounts that are uh, that we're tied into uh, through the internet, and more um, more accounts that we uh, pay our bills automatically, uh, more accounts that we're using websites and other uh, kinds of um, of uh, non-paper services. But someday we're going to need to transition <coughs> control and access of our financial affairs to somebody. And, uh, and so today's presentation is going to give you some ideas about, about that process. Anyway, that day could be tomorrow. Uh, you never know whether the train down here at First Avenue is going a little fast. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not, but it could happen. And so all of a sudden, we, we may need to transition our affairs, and it could be a health reason or or, or other reason in our, in our lives. So that day could come. So it would behoove us all to think about preparation, that somebody is going to take over, not all at once necessarily. It could be a transition. It could be a process. It could be years. But, but there's a transition here that, that's going to happen. And so I'm going to try to get you to think about that a little bit. So we and our loved ones, our immediate family, um, would all probably benefit from a conversation about um, about these affairs, and and uh, you'll see that there's certain um, certain information that uh, these folks are probably interested in, and and certain information we probably should be thinking about 
transitioning to them at, a, at the appropriate time. So in my, in my uh, 36 years of uh, accounting, uh, my clients tended to age about the same age as I did. And, uh, and more and more of them uh, arrived at that transition point um, as they got older and older. And so I found that there were a number of times in my practice that there was a sudden death of a loved one, uh, or maybe not sudden, um, but regardless that there was a transition that needed to occur and somebody needed to, to pick up the pieces, organize it, manage it, and move forward. And frequently it was a spouse, but not always. It was, could have been children, it could have been some other relative, and sometimes it was neither. It might have been um, an institution, a bank, trust department, for example. But somebody needed to pick up the pieces, and as their CPA, I'd seen their financial information for many years. Uh, I, I normally understood their, their, their family and their personal um, styles of uh, managing their finances, and so I was in a kind of a position to help with that transition. The children uh, frequently needed or wanted greater knowledge about their parents' financial affairs. And uh, th there were a number of ways that that happened, sometimes suddenly and sometimes gradually. Um, but, but typically, as people got older, uh, the children might have gotten involved. And there were also other advisors, attorneys, and bankers, and um, people at places like Oak Knoll or other um, senior living places. There were financial uh, applications that people needed to do to uh, drop in to, to apply for you know, living, uh, apply for health care things. So other people outside. And some of the people gradually, some of my clients gradually lost their physical ability to manage their affairs. Um, and others lost their mental ability, and some of them just got tired of doing it and, and uh, just wanted to alleviate the strain and the, and the, um, and the management aspect of things. So, so the lesson I learned from that is a little bit of preparation play, pays, and certainly dealing with the loss of a loved one is difficult enough with all the emotional aspects, but also having to pick up the pieces of uh, financial management and other uh, data and records uh, can be almost uh, overwhelming if you aren't the person who was initially involved in, in those affairs. So this, this happened way too often here. People are digging through the file boxes and the drawers and finding the envelopes that weren't opened and uh, uh, car insurance and titles and people dealing with with, uh, with the change in ownership of all this stuff. So this, this, this whole physical aspect of, of even finding these things uh, is, it, it was, was frequently a problem. But if we do a little bit of preparation and organization now, it'll give us control now. We'll maybe feel a little bit better about, about our own ability to control. And it's certainly uh, organizing a little bit now will facilitate <laughs> Uh, the transition when the, when the time comes. So the surviving spouses, and, and particularly the children who are living in distant locations, they're not here physically in the community, and uh, they, they, may, they may need to get involved and frequently do at some point in their parents' life, and, and if you're not physically able to get together, then there's a huge challenge there. So. But before we go any longer, I want to do a couple of commercials here for you guys on television. Uh, first, we're going to do a commercial for um, Honoring Your Wishes. And Honoring Your Wishes is kind of what got me here. I have and before me a couple of, the, couple of the documents from Honoring Your Wishes. I'm going to pass these things out and you can kind of take a quick look at them if you haven't seen them before. And I can tell you, though, that Honoring Your Wishes is a process that's uh, uh, promoted and supported by Iowa City Hospice here as part of their initiatives. And it's an advanced planning process that uh, enhances our ability to control our 
health care uh, preferences, uh, primarily towards the end of life, but, but the document that uh, hospice and the um, Honoring Your Wishes program uh, promotes is an advanced health care directive, a legal document that, uh, that spells out not only who uh, has a health care power of attorney, but more importantly, I think, it spells out um, what your personal preferences were in terms of quality of life and the kinds of care you would want or not want, preferences upon death, and so on. So honoring your wishes is actually a, um, a legal document. And the process, as I understand it, is that besides attending an informational uh, meeting on honoring your wishes, um, you also then have individual counseling, and Sarah Krieger here uh, with hospice uh, meets individually with people. They have some discussion, go back and forth, uh, prepare a draft document. Am I correct, Sarah? Prepare a, a draft document, and, uh, and, and then when the process is finalized and you're ready to, uh, to make this a legal document, then they lead you through the legalities of signing the form and coach you on how to uh, file the form uh, with um, your health care providers and family members, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I personally attended the presentation. I got to admit, I haven't quite got it finished myself, and my wife hasn't either. So I, I haven't been through totally through the process, but I was impressed by it, and it's something uh, I'm planning to do. And, uh, and I think it's a, a terrific process. But that whole process of, of um, of Advanced Health Care Directive is on the hospice website. And so if you go there, you'll find a little click down there in the lower corner, honoring your wishes. And if you click, you can open up the document that I'm passing around to you is the, is the like a six or seven or eight page health care directive. And filling in the blanks is the, is the science, is the art of it all. Uh, but the, um, the document's in Adobe fillable form that can be uh, prepared and executed. So, so the um, first commercial is over, Advanced Healthcare Directive. <laughs> Second commercial, brought to you by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. <laughs> now, what do they have to do with any of this stuff? Well, I I'm only going to promote one ad. I'm not urging you to go out and get your CPA certificate. But <laughs> the, the, the AICPA does have a website called 360 Degrees of Financial Literacy. And if you Google that, you'll get this website. And I think it's a terrific website that lots of people would benefit by using or getting answers to or using tools here. But they have on this website, you can see that they have life stages here. Tweens, college students, and the employed, the military, the retirees, the, the young couples who are in a uh, professional career track, uh, couples, homeowners, people in crisis. There are all kinds of different life stages that somebody might be in. And if you click on those things, then it opens up to a uh, much more detailed list of topics that would be of interest to people in that situation. And then there are a number of tools as well. You see up there are tools at the top of there. So there's a number of tools that they will drop down that you can use in your personal affairs. So, so I think this is a terrific uh, website. And I got some of my materials from these folks. Most of them, a lot of the materials I'm going to take you to next came from the uh, retirees section of this website. So, so I would promote that. If you haven't looked at it, it might be a good resource for you. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the crucial conversation. But first, before we talk about the kind of crucial conversation dealing with, with your finances today, I want to take you back to a conversation you might have had years ago with your children. And they were maybe this tall or this tall. And they were starting to ask some questions about certain aspects of life. And you wanted to give them some information. But you know, you didn't want to know exactly how much do I want to tell them. And should this be pretty explicit or should be, this be less? So, you know, there was, there was a time in your life long ago that you maybe had a crucial conversation with your children. And uh, so fast forward now, uh, 30, 40, or 50 years later, and I think there's another crucial conversation that they're probably interested in. 
And it's not about drugs, and it's not about sex, and it's not about rock and roll. <laughs> it's, about, it's about you and your financial affairs. And, uh, and, and so we get into this question about how do I talk to my elderly, apologies to the elderly if there are any here, how do I talk to my parents about their finances, or let's turn the conversation around, how do I talk to my children about my finances? And, and, and this is really the materials that, I've, uh, that I'm presenting today that uh, come from the AICPA's website. And it just occurred to me in my uh, professional career of doing tax returns and financial planning that, that, that these kinds of uh, conversations and issues are really a parallel to what uh, hospice is doing with the advanced health care directives. Mm -hmm. it's, it's talking about your health care and your life decisions. It's talking about your personal and your financial decisions. So talking to your parents about money, talking to your children about money, you're going to, this is written, these words, by the way, are talking from the perspective of the children, but you can easily uh, turn that around. This can be difficult. And many in our generation uh, think that this information is private, and it's none of your business. And uh, don't want to share my concerns. I'm not going to give you my opinion. And this is me, and this is you. And, and so, so having that conversation may be difficult for us to have with our loved ones. And it may be difficult for them to uh, open the door to that conversation. But if you're reluctant to talk to them, or they're reluctant to talk to you, uh, you need to have some mutual respect and concern about you know, those, those aspects. Um, but, but your children may, or, or loved ones may have, may have concerns about you, and your financial information may impact their lives. Uh, particularly if you're not able to fully support yourself or you need some assistance in certain areas, managing your affairs, and so on. So uh, probably at the very least, without, without um, handing off any control, we could probably uh, have discussions about personal financial records, housing, health care, budgeting, and what kind of plans we might have for our estates. So there, there, there's probably some, there's probably some gra uh, medium ground in there that, um, that, we, that we can have a conversation. But what if I'm not quite ready to talk to them? And if I'm still able to manage my personal affairs, you know, maybe we drop it and agree to talk about it at a future point. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe things in my life change that I'm more likely to, to um, uh, have that conversation with my loved ones. Um, but there could be another avenue to, to these discussions. One could be another family member, a trusted friend, a personal financial advisor, attorney. Some, could be somebody else who kind of acts as a bit of intermediary. And, and I think I did that a number of times in my career when, uh, when uh, my clients were in a stage of transition. But there'd be two important aspects of, of, of this kind of crucial conversation. One would be you know, whether I'm ready to have the discussion with them and whether they're ready to have the discussion with me. So this motorcycle goes 160 miles an hour. And my son just bought one and says, geez, Dad, I just got this crotch rocket. Now, do you think I'm ready to have the conversation with my son at this point? <laughs> Probably not. So, so the time has to be right. They have to be ready. You know, they have to reach a stage of maturity, uh, financial independence, hopefully, and, um, and to be able to have the conversation. So, so I need to be ready to have the conversation. They need the, the time has to be right. And, and, and I, I'm certainly not going to coach anybody here on when that time is or or you help, or you happen, to, or how to open the door to the conversation. But what I am going to talk about is, what do you think that they need to know? And they probably need to know something when the time is right about which financial institutions you use, your bank and brokerage, insurance policies, and they probably need to know. It would be helpful if they knew something about your account and account numbers and online usernames and passwords and life insurance and. What are your Social Security and disability? And how do you pay for your Medicare supplement policy? And, 
and how about the car titles and the, and the abstract of the house if you have one. And so there's a number of things there that they probably uh, legitimately would need to know when the time is right. And then they probably would need to know something about, you know, do you use any financial or tax advisors? Uh, and who are they? And what's your relationship with them? And uh, this sort of gets into what's the relationship? How often do they meet with them? And would it be helpful for your loved ones to join that, uh, one of those conversations or be introduced to these people uh, one way or another? Um, and, and, uh, and, and then the, your loved ones probably need to know, at least conceptually, uh, how, are you, how are you doing on your finances? Are you able to manage your, your bills? And do you need help with credit card statements and making sure that payments are made on time or, or uh, keeping track of medical expenses or medical appointments and property taxes getting paid on time. So there may be some things like that that um, the children need to know. So uh, they probably would like to know something about if you have a durable power of attorney, if you have one of these advanced health care directives, uh, uh, your will, uh, other other legal documents that that um, that an adult child might use to manage um, financial affairs. And do you have a will? And where is it? And who's the executor? And if it's more than five years old, is it still fairly current? And are their wishes really what uh, what were um, what they were when the will was drafted? Um, do they have sp personal specific designations for, you know, the China collection or, um, or, or whatever? So, so those are things that, that would be helpful to have the conversation about. Okay, so, so I'm going to, um, oh, oh, this is an important one. Are the beneficiary designations up to, up to, up to uh, uh, up to date. So your beneficiary designations, particularly on your retirement accounts, are extremely important because those designations on the form trump anything that's in your will. So it make, makes little difference if you want to leave your retirement account to somebody. If you put it in your will, it doesn't count. What counts is if you filled out the form correctly and given the right name and percentage of beneficiaries. So that would be, so those are things that any of us probably every couple of years ought to be looking at these things and refresh ourselves about, about. And you have an overall estate plan, a trust, a living trust, etc. So, so there's, there's a number of things that when the time is right for the conversation, when they're, when they're ready and you're ready, maybe not all at the same time, seldom at the same time, but over some kind of a transition period, um, how can you have that conversation? Well, I'm going to suggest a couple things today that I think would help in the transition, uh, and you'll have to decide what, what parts of it you'd like to implement, if any. But number one, I would say, is prepare a personal financial statement. Um, and, and I'll give you an example of that, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But prepare a personal financial statement. It's a short, easy, big picture of your finances. It's got the numbers on it. It doesn't take very long to prepare, and, uh, and it gives somebody um, you know, the best immediate snapshot of your finances. Uh, secondly, as an organizer of some kind, to gather all this information that we just talked about, and we're going to spend some more time talking about what kind of information might go in your organizer and how to, um, how, how to electronically manage it and how to manage it paper-wise. And then, then for, for those of you who are, have multiple and significant uh, internet accounts uh, that manages many aspects of your life, then uh, identifying those things, saving them, uh, identifying your logins and passwords, and so on. So first, we'll go over to the uh, personal financial statement. I think someplace in your handout, you have on paper a, a, a piece of this, but a, but a personal financial statement is, uh, is, is an accounting, uh, numerical accounting measurement, if you will, of your assets and your liabilities uh, that results in the difference between the two of them uh, is, is what you call your net worth. 
And so the typical kinds of assets that you would have would be, of course, your, your cash and bank accounts, um, uh, receivables of any, if you have any loans that uh, someone is repaying to you, or other amounts that are due to you. It could be your tax refunds. If you happen to be an investor in a rental property or a corporation or a closely held business, you'd list that. Uh, then you have your marketable securities, uh, 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 certificates of deposit, uh, brokerage accounts, or your retirement accounts, um, cash value of your life insurance. And then you get into some of your more personal aspects, like your collectibles, your furniture and your household goods and clothing and stuff like that, that, that are, are a lot harder to value, frankly, and and um, and. Um, and that probably would be just recorded as an estimated number. The, counts pay, the liabilities are a little easier to manage, a little easier to measure, but they're all basically at the amount that would be your, your accounts payable, your credit cards, your uh, car loans, your um, mortgage, um, and other personal loans, if any, um, so accrued property taxes, and so on. So liabilities are measured at whatever amounts they are. The assets are measured more likely at estimated value, what you call estimated value. That'd be, that'd be the amount of a buyer might be willing to pay. Uh, some of these things you can estimate fairly well, um, even though they might have a broad range. What's the value of your home? Well, you can look and see what the, what the Johnson County Assessor lists it at, but you can see what the neighbors sell for. You could look in the papers. You could make a guess and round it off, but nobody knows that number until you actually sell it. So it's an estimate. And the value of your vehicles and your collectibles and your artwork and so on, these numbers tend to be fairly, uh, fairly um, rounded estimates. You'd record these at some kind of a reasonable guess and kind of keep them on a consistent basis. Some of them are just, a, just an indication that I have some household and personal effects, but. But, but you probably would not, in preparing a personal financial statement, sit down and make an inventory of all of them. You just put a number in there. So you, have. so you would probably have, when you prepare a personal financial statement, you probably have, you try to have a simplified statement that lists your assets, your liabilities, and your net worth. On, if you've maintained this on a comparative basis for a couple of years, then you have a greater ability to kind of see the trends and what's happening, and is my net worth going up or down, and and so that can give you some some insights and perspective over a several year period of time if you keep the things. I would suggest most people do this once a year. Do it at tax time, at the end of the year. Um, and you can do it on a sheet of paper. You can do it, this is an Excel template, which works pretty well. Um, you can do it, uh, you can also find these th statements online. If you Google personal financial statements, you, your, uh, your browser will find you a number of these things where you can fill in the forms. And so the idea would be to find one that you like and can use on it. But whatever it is you use, you probably have try to get the big picture on page one. And then you might have some sub accounts over here that to show what, what's in the cash group and the savings in bank A and bank B and what were the receivables and, and uh, what were the tax refunds and listing your vehicles and their estimated value. And, what kind of stuff is in your accounts payable? So you can keep, you know, use a use something in a little more detail. Try to keep try to keep the primary page to the big picture, and then do something else to keep track of the detail. And in particular, it, it's probably relevant to uh, to be even more detailed in your financial accounts, your your investments, your marketable securities, and your retirement accounts, and not only split out what's the total for our household, but it's important in this case to split it out by who owns it. So if it's jointly held, you split it between spouse A and spouse B, but if it's my retirement account, I'd list it in my column. If it's my wife's, list it in her column, because that has um, a lot of significance to estate planning and how you're gonna draw down the money someday. So, so I, would, I would encourage people at any stage in life, if you're 30 years old, it's a big good idea to do this. And it helps you get some perspective over a long period of time about your finances. You would like them for over a period of time to, for your net worth to increase, but at least it helps you monitor and understand. And if you're going to transition to someone, I think this is a really good tool to use. 
Okay, the second document is um, is is uh, is your personal financial uh, uh, information, and uh, I, I have chosen. The, you can you can find organizer forms in many from many sources. You can find them on the internet. I chose this one from the good folks at uh, Merrill Lynch, I believe it is, Merrill Lynch, uh, and and I chose it uh, not because the form is perfect, but it's pretty good. And it is an Adobe fillable form, so you can download this thing from the internet, and you can drop in here the names and amounts and phone numbers and so on. You can drop it in. Uh, but more important than, than the utility of their particular uh, financial organizer, uh, I, think it's a, I think it's a really good uh, checklist of stuff that it is that you would want to accumulate, save, and someday transition to your, to your loved ones. So it starts off with the key contacts. Uh, this particular form, one of the deficiencies, I think, is that it does not have uh, emails on there. It just has names and phone numbers, and almost everybody in this group was going to have an email. But this goes to your, through your key contacts. Uh, if you were doing this on yourself, you might want to, you know, maybe you've got several physicians in here that you want to list, and your dentist and your optometrist. And, and so on and so on. So you 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 want to tailor this obviously to your own um, to your own financial situation. But going through the set of key contacts here, this form I think gives you a pretty good pretty good list of 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 who's who in your financial and personal uh, lives and and, um, and and documents. So uh, got the veterinarian in there. Don't want to forget them. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, goes down to the utilities. So, so I don't. So I'm not necessarily promoting this particular form, but I think that the kind of the checklist of stuff it has in there it would be real useful if you're trying to develop your own set of forms. Maybe you want to use this one or another one that you find that's sort of prepared for you, or maybe you want to do the whole thing yourself you know, using a Word or Excel document. Uh, you can use a sheet of paper. You can use a three-ring notebook paper, uh, which works just great. A three-ring notebook with some file dividers in there. You can have first file divider would be your, would be your advisors and, and the people on your key contacts list here. So, 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 technology that I'm promoting. It's the idea that we sit down and try to inventory and come up with 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 who's who and what's what in our financial lives. So, so here we go down to uh, uh, the next set of uh, documents. Is I guess they call this personal. So, yeah, where's the birth certificates? Where's the uh, where is the um, passport? Uh, where's the prenup agreement? Here, somebody's going to want to know that. <laughs> Marriage certificate, uh, military discharge, the safe and the combination, and uh, the safe deposit box, and so on and so on. So. Uh, so there's a good checklist of thing, and this one I think was designed that people kind of keep the stuff, you know, for example, in the file cabinet in the basement. Um, but in fact, some of these things may be found online. They may be scanned documents. They, 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 they might be in your home. They might be in, in a safe box at the bank. Next group has to do with ownership. So here we have the titles. Uh, and the real estate deeds, I guess in Iowa, it'd be, I guess it would be your abstract and your title opinion probably uh, when, you, when you, you get a packet of documents an inch thick that tells about the history of your property from way back when and when you own, and when you own or buy a home in Iowa, use the, the abstract as the um, motor vehicle titles, other titles, uh, things like the appraisal of uh, if you did have um, Jewelries, antiques, or other collectibles that were of, of um, you know a, a really significant value. You may have, you may have uh, uh, <coughs> appraisals or other documents, receipt when you bought these things. Those all could be relevant, and they're not only relevant to um, to your loved ones who may, you may need to transition to, but they're also relevant in many cases to insurance purposes. So, so having some indication of what those items are and their value. And then you have your, your um, banking or financial institution documents. Um, 
so this this is where uh, this is where, for example, the document this this particular piece of technology maybe doesn't work that well. Your account statements, and if you're using online banking, uh, those those documents are available on online. You can access them anytime with most of your local institutions for at least three years, sometimes five, and often seven years. Documents can be accessed. All my credit card statements, I can get at them just like that. Just open the website and find them. So I don't have any of those things in paper. They don't exist in paper. I wouldn't keep them more than a couple of years, but they're all available there. Same with checking, uh, savings accounts, money market accounts. So I can start to go through, start to go through the items that are relevant. And then the last one probably <coughs> needs to be expanded for for some of us. Uh, th this could be a whole uh, page on on what they call online bill paying information. Because how many of us, how many of us get a bill for our uh, cell phones? Almost nobody. You know, and the and the cable TV and the trash and the newspaper and how many of these places you don't even get statements for? They just charge your bank account from time to time. So so having that list of who who am I paying? Am I paying it through my checking account? Am I paying it through my uh, credit card? How do how do I not only do I pay these accounts, but which which accounts do I pay them out of? So this this probably is a whole uh, section. Uh, that, uh, that you should start to organize in detail. And then you get into the estate and the wills and the trusts, um, living wills, healthcare power of attorneys, the, the uh, healthcare directives we talked about, cemetery, uh, funeral home pre planning, and so on. So I think, I think what I'm trying to promote here isn't necessarily that there's any technology, but, but that you think about your, about your inventory of, of items that meet these different categories, and you think about those things that in your life would be uh, most important for you to pass on to someone and, and, and for someone to be able to find and, and, and take over these things at one time. And, um, and then decide for yourself whether you want to use a three-ring notebook with some file dividers. Do you want to do this thing all in paper with a typewriter? If you're computer literate, is it in a, is it in a um, word processor or, a, or an electronic spreadsheet? Um, and, um, and, and so use this as your... Now you also, I think you ought to think about going just online and, and um, Googling personal financial organizer, and you'll find a whole bunch of these. I chose this one because I thought it had the best inventory of items that I thought would be most relevant, but I also thought it had some deficiencies because it doesn't give you room to expand and add categories. It doesn't give you room for the, for the emails and websites. So it's not perfect, but it's, but it's good to think about. Okay, the third thing I want to talk about is your, uh, how your financial lives are complicated by all this online banking and internet stuff. And if you're like me, I got a ton of these things. My whole financial life is on an internet, and it's got a website and a login and a password and security words. And so somehow, if you're using these things uh, uh, to a significant affair, it behooves you to have a list that's current, up-to-date, and accurate ab about what these things are. Uh, and so what I'm illustrating here is one where, uh, this is an Excel document, so I'm illustrating where we use a a tab for for your different financial accounts, and that can be anywhere from your from your bank account and your debit account, um, your health savings account, and all your credit card accounts. Uh, you got your brokerages on there, and I'll also put things on there like PayPal if you're using that. Uh, you know, it could be Vanguard or Schwab or Fidelity or or whomever, uh, and. Um, Life insurance, so you have to think for yourself about what, what are your, what are the accounts and websites that you're using, what are the logins. So set something up that identifies the website. Although many uh, in many situations, you don't need to use that. You can just Google it, and if you want, if you want um, fidelity, just Google fidelity, and you'll come up with a login. But your website, what's the username, what's the password or the PIN number? And then frequently, particularly on the financial sites, they have a security word or two. You know, you have to, what's the name of your childhood friend or your 
mother's former husband or something like that. <laughs> so. Which one? <laughs> okay, so uh, what I've done is organized mine according to financial websites, and then you know you may have some professional ones of one kind, a licensing organization, uh, a, a, a science or a, or a healthcare organization, <laughs> somebody where you're a member or something. It could be a hobby group. It could be whatever whatever you're using in your life. But I've sort of organized those, uh, and then you could have a group of just kind of personal stuff. You know, got your library card and your Netflix and your and your eBay's and Amazons and all those. And for those of you who are heavy shoppers, you may have a whole tab over here for all the online, you know, on the, all the online catalogs and places that you order stuff from. And, and you, whether you mix or match these, organize them however you want, but, but I think it's a good idea to, to uh, save these. And then travel could be a category, and certainly health care could be a category that could have your health insurance and your medical providers. In this case, U of I has a my chart, has a online access to your medical records at the university system, uh, prescription plans, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then you could have maybe communications. So that would be your phone and your cable and your internet and your magazine subscriptions and so on. So now the hard part, after you get this organized and get this thing prepared, you've got your list, you've figured out who's who, and what are my logins and passwords, and you've got this all current and up to date. You need to, A, keep it up to date, and you need to protect it somehow. So then you've got to say, how do I want to protect it? And, and I'm not going to tell you exactly how to protect it, because there's a lot of controversy about that, and I don't want to be responsible if it, your stuff gets hacked into. But you could think about keeping the thing off your computer on a flash drive, in a file in the flash drive. You could keep it on paper, and you hide it in the upstairs closet above the old basketball, you know. You can think of where it is that you're safe and secure with. You could keep it completely off-site if you uh, have a system to do that. Um, so, so you have to think about once you have this is this is really pretty darn uh, important and in secure information. You don't want this stuff getting lost, and so if the tornado wipes out your house and all the stuff is gone, that's a problem. So, so you have to think about in, in your life and what you have. How is it you're going to save and protect the stuff? Are you going to have a second duplicate copy someplace, or are you going to uh, keep it in a different room in the house? Or are you going to uh, save it to a, a, a cloud site someplace uh, that'll, that'll maintain these things for you. So I'm not, an, I'm not an internet security expert by any means. I don't think anybody is anymore. But so I'm going to be, I'm going to back off from telling you how to, how to save this thing. But it is important to organize the stuff to figure out what do you have, keep it current, and then figure for you what's the best system you can come up with to. Uh, to, uh, to save and protect this stuff. So, okay, so from here, I've given you three basic ideas about um, uh, uh, about how you could prepare for that conversation someday. What, what data would somebody need to know someday, uh, now or slowly? Uh, and, and the three ideas I had is. Uh, prepare a personal financial statement that gives a big picture of your finances. That, that's really pretty easy to do. It does not take anybody very long to do that. Uh, secondly would be to prepare, um, uh, prepare your personal document organizer in whatever form and format that works for you. And that does take actually quite a bit of time. To, to, but once it's done and up to date, if you're using some kind of technology, it's pretty easy to update. Uh, periodically, once a year or so on. So putting it together the first time might be a, a bit of a chore. Um, and, and then the third document is to organize, save, and protect all your internet stuff. Uh, now, I'll just say one thing, little thing about transition. If you're using some of this technology, there, there's, there's certain aspects of your personal financial information, your organizer back here. Uh, and the reason, that I, the reason that I chose this particular document to illustrate is that if you notice there's no numbers in here so you so you can tell somebody and chances are you're going to be less um, less uncomfortable about saying I have a life insurance policy 
and here's who it's with, and here's the policy number, and here's the 800 number to call. You're probably not going to be too uncomfortable about that. Now, telling them how much is it and who's the beneficiary, you know, you got to think about that, whether, whether that's the conversation you're ready for or not. So, but, but, the, but, but, in, but giving this information about, about some of the details without giving the numbers, uh, you, you might be more co comfortable about making that kind of transition. And maybe some of it you're ready to, to, uh, to pass on and communicate and have a discussion with, and maybe some of it you're not. So, so, but, but I do like the idea of sort of separating, here's the numbers, which most of us are a little more sensitive about the numbers than we are in the fact that I have a retirement account and it's with da da da, and it's an IRA account and da da da, and I draw this much amount. We're probably not quite as uncomfortable about that conversation. So, uh, flipping back to uh, just a kind of a quick rundown of a couple of other, I think in your handout someplace, if you're into the three ring notebook uh, file tabs, uh, paper organizer, this is just some ideas for what your file tabs and organizer uh, might have on it. And you can make up your own and organize them the way that makes sense for you and your affairs. But, you could do the same thing that this document does using some common topics like that. And in wrapping up, I'm going to do just one more thing. We're going to just go through a couple of, of um, financial organization tips. And you know, take what you like and leave the rest. Number one tip, tr try to simplify your financial lives if you can. And there's reasons sometimes that our lives are more complicated and there's nothing we can do about it. That's just the way it's going to be. But if you can use fewer accounts, you know, if you've got seven <laughs> credit cards and you can only need two, if you've got 12 bank accounts and only need three, whatever you can do to try to simplify and use fewer accounts, it tends to help simplify our financial affairs. Uh, second one, get control of your finances when the mail comes in the door. And I think it's a good idea to immediately separate from all the catalogs and the junk mail and the Coles ad, separate the important stuff like the bills I have to pay and get those things out of there and put them on the desk in the wherever you keep them that tells me that that is a bill that needs to be paid or maybe it's a thank you card for an, for a, for an event you've attended, whatever it is. This one needs my attention and this one is kind of important to me because a lot of our stuff just is, you know, it's junk today. So get the, get the good stuff separated from the bad and you can read your magazines and, uh, at, at, at your leisure, but get, get, get your financial affairs and your personal response items out of the rest of the mail and get them in a, in a, in a safe place. Okay, keep all your tax receipts in a file folder, just nothing better than a file folder to save you, you know, I'm talking about your contributions and your car licenses and your real estate taxes if you pay those and anything that you might deduct on your tax returns. And then when the uh, first of the year comes, you're going to get your W-2s and 1099s and Social Security statements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, they've got 80% of our lives on record already and those documents are going to come to you in January and early February. Just immediately put those things in a file folder. And then when you're preparing your tax returns, that should give you a, a high percent. If not everything, it'll give you a high percent of what you need. And it's a lot easier going through that file folder than it is going back through your checking account and certainly going back through your credit card statements and, and so on. So, and, and if you're a person who makes lots of contributions, put a separate file folder for the contributions. Just separate those so they don't, get, so they don't overwhelm the other file folder. Uh, the one, the, the, normally the, the record retention that you really ought to be thinking about is three years for income tax purposes. After three years, m most of your documents don't need to be retained anymore. But the ones that do need to be retained would be those that relate to, you know, assets that you've purchased that have value and you would turn into the insurance company in the case of a fire, theft, or et cetera, et cetera. So if you buy the TV or the sofa, the car, Whatever it is, you want to save those. You want to save those documents a long time because they give evidence as to what the cost of them was and what was the make and model, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So those documents you should consider to be long-term documents, and you're really saving them for insurance purposes, among other things. 
uh, use your online uh, bank accounts and credit card if you can and if you are comfortable with that. Don't, don't put yourself out there where you're not comfortable with it, but if you can use those things and automate your payments and reduce the mail, uh, it's also a great security thing that, you know, when you don't get a bank statement in the mail anymore, nobody's going to steal the thing. It's online. So use those, but you have to be, you have to do it within your comfort level. Uh, if you got a digital camera, which doesn't cost much anymore, at some point, just for insurance purposes, go walk around every room in your house, open the drawers, and take a picture of what's in there. Go through your bedroom and your kitchen and your garage and go through the whole house. And uh, probably in about 30 minutes, you can photograph your entire house and you'll have a good record of what's in there. And it might not be a perfectly detailed, but it's, but, it's, but it's a pretty good one. So that if you ever do have uh, an insurance event, that you, that you have a good um, inventory that you can create from your photographs. Um, back up your computer, um, your computer and your files, and consider off-site uh, storage of those items. There's a number of cloud services which keeps your data backed up in the internet cloud. Uh, I use one called Carbonite, and it's an automatic 24-7. Uh, Anything I have on my computer gets backed up, and I can access those files from from any place, and there's a number of those services out there. They're not real expensive, and uh, that way you never need to fear about losing your your files. Okay, for the for the very sophisticated, if you're way out there in the leading edge of financial management, consider using Quicken or Microsoft's Money or one of these financial uh, money management software tools. Uh, that's not for everybody. It's not for very many people, frankly. But, but it can work great for if you're into that. And you can download your transactions from your bank accounts, from your credit cards, from uh, investment statements. You can download those transactions into the software. You can have a, a good, um, highly detailed um, financial record of your, of your receipts and disbursements and help you with budgeting purposes. It'll help you find uh, what you bought and what you spend on a particular category. But that's not for everyone. Go paperless in your statements if you're comfortable doing that. Uh, keep your tax receipts and records only as long as you needed to, and and three years uh, in, unless you're unless you're committing a fraud or didn't file a return or one of those really <laughs> egregious things. Three years is all the IRS can examine and will examine your financial records. It is an exception if you bought if you're depreciating a vehicle or a building or something like that. You, you might need to keep those records longer than three years. But for your basic personal financial records, uh, you know, after you file three years of tax returns, they, your, your records are, uh, can be. Uh, don't keep these documents too long. And think about uh, shredding. So we just had Saturday at Goodwill right here on First Avenue had a shredding day. And I think there's several others coming up in the community. I know Viridian Credit Union does it from time to time and other people do it from time to time, but you can save those documents, your tax returns, credit card statements, bank statements, all these things. And from time to time, you can take those down and they'll put them in a secure uh, shredder. Uh, and uh, we tar already talked about the automatic bill payments. So we have just a couple of minutes left to wrap up here today. I thought I'd see if there's any particular questions or comments. All the paper that you get from past jobs that are in boxes, can you just throw that away? Well, I, I would be concerned about the, uh, yeah, I think the question is if you have a, a paper from your last employment, you know, pay, yeah. payroll Where records. Boxes yeah. Boxes. No, there's, there's no reason to keep documents unless they relate to your income tax return, which is all you really need is three years, or if it relates to an insurance, you know, if, if you need to keep that for insurance purposes. But, but many of the records you may have stored in here, there, and around are not necessary to keep. Now, I would encourage you to think about getting rid of them in a secure fashion. And, yeah, and in this case, it sounds like you'd want to use a secure shredding machine. Uh, and you can use a personal shredder, but it takes forever. What happened to seven years? I always heard You know, seven, se years. Seven, seven, seven years is a guideline that, that most businesses use. And seven years is OK, but, but three years is all you really need. And particularly if you're, if you're using, um, if the record is a, is a bank statement, a brokerage statement, a, a financial institution, all those statements are, are, are available 
quickly and easily. They, they never really go away. So. Yes? And what about the initial tax return form? How long did you have to keep uh, that? The, the, the tax return forms itself, you know, I, I, I really just encourage you to save those for a long time. But, you know, in, in my case, I've just scanned them. So I, the, the, actual, the actual tax return document that you may have signed and filed is, is, is really not relevant. You can, you, can, you can get a copy of all your prior returns from, from the Internal Revenue Service for a small fee. You can get a transcript, a summary. But, but the return itself, if you want to keep those for a long period of time, you might consider scanning them. But, but generally, I do encourage people to keep their tax returns, the, doc, the return itself. They always say, keep everything that pertains to your IRAs. What exactly do they mean by everything? Well, I would say that virtually every IRA account is, is handled by a, a, a sophisticated financial institution. So, so the, as the contributions went into your account, uh, there's never going to be a time that you're going to have to go back and make an accounting of how much did I put in year by year by year. So Fidelity or Vanguard or Schwab or your employer or TI Cref, whoever it is, as those amounts went into your account, you have an account balance in there. And, and so, th so there's really nothing to maintain. It went through an employer uh, retirement account or it went through an individual retirement account with an institution. So there really isn't much to retain back there. You do need to, of course, be able to uh, uh, report what you've drawn as a distribution for your retirement account. But, but there isn't much you need to go back and keep all your pay stubs to show how much you went into the account. Anything else? Yeah. Going back to much earlier, the power of attorney, uh, there was two stipulations on when it, you could use it or go to the two people agree or I mean is there some legal thing that says now you can use power of attorney or just you know what I'm saying do you can At you what just point does it become effective yeah when yeah. I have power of attorney with my mother mm -hmm. yeah. when I mean does she have to say now you can use it or what if she doesn't recognize that I need yeah. to use it and and there, is there a legal process to start using it yeah, I'm, I'm going to leave that. Uh, I'm, not going to, um, I'm not going to give you advice on that. I think that's something that probably dis deserves a uh, discussion with an attorney and it depends on what the document is and what its purpose is and whether it's current and up-to-date and meets Iowa code. And, and so uh, uh, and that's, I'm not an attorney and I think I'd prefer to, to leave that. Now with the health care power of attorneys though, I think that, uh, I, I think that that's a matter of having those uh, updated and on file with your appropriate uh, health care providers and your family members, and then, then there's a notification process, am I correct? So for the health care power of attorney, it's um, so if you're selected as the agent, um, it's when the person can no longer make decisions for themselves. Um, and oftentimes um, that will be the medical community will help to make that determination. Does that make, answer your question? On that part, of it, right. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's the part I know. There might be a parallel with your, with your other financial yes. power of attorneys there, too. Okay, I'm going to stay for more uh, questions and conversations. If you should have any, we're going to wrap up now so the folks uh, on uh, Iowa City Public TV can uh, commence. And uh, thank you all for uh, attending today. City Channel 4. 
on TV, online, on demand, on Facebook, and now on the go on your mobile device.